Okay, good morning to this new IAA webinar. Today we have the presence of uh, Pavel Mancera Piña. He will talk about exploring the origin of gas rich ultra diffuse galaxies with H1 kinematics. And uh, our friend Mike Jones will make a good introduction of Pavel. <laughs> Okay, so as Rene said, uh, Pavel is our speaker today. Um, I, I met Pavel, I guess, a few years ago uh, when uh, we ended up preparing a GTC proposal together. And since then, we've uh, collaborated on a few other proposals and bumped into each other at several conferences and, and meetings where Pavel always gave excellent talks. Um, uh, so that was... Uh, critical in the motivation of uh, inviting him as, as well. Um, so uh, pa Pavel completed his undergraduate degree uh, at the Universidad Veracruzana in Mexico, and then moved to the Netherlands to the University of Groningen um, for his master's and PhD um, with the, uh, the Nova Fellowship. Um, and he's working there with uh, Rainier Peltier, uh, Filippo Frattinelli, Elizabeth Adams, uh, among among others, um, and and so uh, Pavel is is still in the middle of his PhD, um, but he's been working on ultra diffuse galaxies pretty much right from the beginning after after they were first identified en masse in in Virgo and Coma, um, and so uh, he's he's an expert in this field. Um, and especially in terms of the kinematics of, of gas-rich ultra-diffuse galaxies. Um, so, so I invited Pavel to give this talk today uh, because I'm sure it will provide uh, a really great introduction and update to this uh, exciting field. So Pavel, please take it away. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for such a nice introduction, for the invitation, and thank you everybody for, for being here, for attending the, this webinar. Uh, so, so yes, uh, as Mike was saying, I am, I am Pavel doing my PhD at the Captain Institute at the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy, where I work uh, with Filippo Fraternali, uh, who is my main supervisor, and Betsy Adams and Tom Osterlo are my co-supervisors. Uh, and today, I'm going to tell you about the results uh, that we and our collaborators are finding uh, regarding ultra-diffuse galaxies. Specifically, how are we using H1 kinematics to try to understand uh, the origins of these galaxies? Uh, now, I know that there in Granada you have a, a very wide, uh, a wide variety of research interests. So I will start with a, a brief introduction to, to make sure that we're all on the same page. So allow me to start with uh, saying a few things about, the, about gas kinematics. So as you know, uh, cold metal hydrogen, or H1, uh, is visible via a 21 centimeter observations. So what happens is that if you have the hydrogen atom and there is a change uh, uh, in, the, in the energy state, a spin flip, then this change in, in energy uh, emits an emission line. And the wearing of this emission line is 21 centimeters that then we can see, especially in these galaxies. Now, uh, these galaxies show very extended H1 disks. How extended? Well, you can see it here in this picture where you have on the left, uh, well, the stellar emission coming from this galaxy. And then on the right, you can see exactly the same galaxy at the same scale, but for the H1, which you can also see here. You see the stellar emission here, sort of in the background, and then the, the gas emission around it. So we can see that they are very extended, these, these H1 disks. And not only they are very extended, but they also rotate. And basically, we know this because of, of, the, of the Doppler effect. So if you look at the emission lines coming from the center of the galaxy, they will peak at a given wavelength. And then if you look at the emission lines in one side or the other of the galaxy, you will see that the same emission line is blue shifted in one side and red shifted in the other side. And well, because of the Doppler effect, we know that this is because one side of the galaxy is approaching, the other side of the galaxy is receding. And basically, if you trace, if you could observe the line profiles of the galaxies, of the galaxies uh, at uh, any given uh, point, position, then thanks to the Doppler effect, you could trace what is the velocity at which the gas is moving at any given position inside the galaxy. And with that, you can build a so-called velocity field that you can see here, where the color is showing the velocity at which the gas in that part of the galaxy is moving. 
And then what you usually do is you observe this velocity field. You assume that the galaxies are formed uh, of, of concentric rings. And then you see, okay, each ring is characterized by which rotation velocity. So if you do that, you end up with a rotation curve. So you all have seen a plot like this that shows the rotation velocity of a galaxy in the x-axis, and here in the y-axis is at the radius or the center from the center, uh, the distance from the center of the galaxy. So the rotation curve as traced by the, by the cold gas, by the H1, will be these blue points over here. The thing is that if you look at the stars and at the gas inside the galaxy, you will expect something that looks rather like this uh, white dashed line. And uh, as you know, this was one of the first uh, and most clear uh, evidence of the existence of dark matter, because then this difference in velocity is there because there is a discrepancy in, in the potential, which is a difference in the mass, which is the, the, the dark matter. And well, the rotation curves of galaxies in general are very useful not only to study the rotation itself, but also because they give us access to important information about, for instance, the angular momentum of galaxies, which is a fundamental property that regulates the evolution of galaxies at all redshift, and also about the dark matter distribution inside galaxies, as I was just discussing. Now, uh, different galaxies have different types of rotation curve. So broadly speaking, uh, we can classify a galaxies in two very wide groups. One of them uh, consists of those galaxies that are massive, that are bright, and, I will, and we call them high surface brightness galaxies. And on the other group, we have a smaller galaxies, dwarf galaxies, fainter galaxies, that we call low surface brightness galaxies. And they have different rotation curves, as you can see here on the bottom. So what we have here is, again, the rotation curve, so velocity versus radius, as traced by the H1, which are these black, uh, the, the black points. Now, because we know the distribution of stars and gas in the galaxy, we can uh, infer what is the contribution of stars and gas, here shown stars in blue and gas in green, to the rotation curve, to the observed rotation curve. And because you know what is the contribution of stars and gas, you can then uh, find what the contribution of the dark matter halo should be such that when you take into account the three components, you manage to reproduce the offset rotation curve, which in this case, when you take into account the three components, you end up with this red line. Now, high surface brightness galaxies have this characteristic shape of the rotation curve. So it goes up super quickly, and then it becomes flat until the, the last measured uh, uh, radii. Instead, if we look at low, ah, and something else that is very important is that if you see here, the inner parts of the rotation curve are dominated by the potential of the, by the mass of the stars. It, then the stars become less and less important, so the dark matter dominates at, at the outer rings, sure, but in the inner parts, the stars can dominate, and this is a feature a very common in, in high surface brightness galaxies. Now, if you look at low surface, uh, low surface brightness galaxies instead, you see some very clear uh, differences. Not only, of course, because they are less massive, the rotation velocities are lower, but also the shape of the rotation curve is different. This is particularly clear if you could plot uh, the, the x-axis uh, such that they are normalized, for example, with the disk scale length of the galaxies. But here we can also see it, because in general, low surface brightness galaxies, uh, instead of having this quickly rising and then becoming flat rotation curve, they have this slowly rising rotation curve that then again gets to the flat part. Uh, but the other big difference is that, uh, as you can see, if now we look at the contribution of stars, gas, and dark matter, well, first, gas becomes more important than stars, which wasn't happening in the high surface brightness galaxies. But what is more important is that the dark matter contribution dominates at any given uh, position. At all radii, the dark matter halo dominates the potential of the galaxy opposite to what was happening here, where the stars dominate at least the inner part. So low surface brightness galaxies are dominated by a dark matter component uh, at all radii. Now, what am I making uh, this, this emphasis in low surface brightness galaxies? Well, because uh, ultra diffuse galaxies, or UDGs by short, are just a extremes of class uh, of low surface brightness galaxies. Why are they an extremes of class? Well, as you can see uh, in the picture, 
in terms of total luminosities, in terms of total mass, ultra diffuse galaxies are very much alike uh, dwarf galaxies. But then when you want to compare things like the disk scale length or the effective radius of the galaxies of the light distribution, they resemble more massive spiral galaxies like Andromeda, our own Milky Way. And it's the combination of these two properties what makes these galaxies uh, so, so puzzling, so interesting, and that's what we want to, to understand. Now, given that they are kind of uh, weird from this point of view, one may wonder if they are just, you know, you just have one or two isolated objects each now and then, but they are not really uh, abundant. Well, we know now that they are present in different environments from very high uh, gas, uh, uh, very high mass galaxy clusters to galaxy groups and even in the field. And here I just show you some examples where you can see a bit more clear how diffuse they are. You can usually see the, the galaxies and the stars uh, on the background. You can also see they have, they may have slightly different morphologies and colors. Uh, and then, oops, the, the other thing that people uh, found, people like, like Renko Vandenburg or Javier Roman, who is also there in, in Granada, was that uh, there is this clear relationship between the number of UDGs uh, inside a cluster as a function of the mass of that cluster or galaxy group. And basically, uh, well, this, these results have been complemented by many people in the literature, but what people have found is that this uh, relation scales uh, linearly with, with the cluster mass. Uh, it is not very clear what happens when you go to the field. Mike has a very interesting paper when, where he discusses this. It's very likely that this relation has to break because otherwise you don't account for, for all the isolated UDGs that we observe. Uh, but what I want to say here is that we can see that UDGs, even if they are not a, a enormous number, they are not present in enormous numbers, they are a, a, a population that is interesting to, to study. Now, they are present in different environments, and they also show a dichotomy in the gas fraction. As you can see uh, here, this, this plot shows the gas fraction, so it's the ratio between the H1 mass and the stellar mass as a function of the stellar mass for a sample of galaxies. In particular, if you look at the green contours, this is the alfalfa catalog, and then the colorful points show UDGs. And people have found that if you look at those UDGs uh, that are actually isolated, they tend to have a very high gas fractions opposite to those UDGs that are not isolated. So the conclusion here is that uh, usually isolated UDGs are uh, gas rich. And we are interested in that subset of the, uh, of the population that is gas rich because then we can study the gas kinematics. Now, uh, just to reinforce a bit my, my previous point, uh, gas rich uh, of field UDGs uh, uh, I, they constitute about 5-6% of all galaxies with H1 masses around 10 to the 9 solar masses, as found by, by Mike. And there are also some simulations that uh, uh, they find that UDGs are, in general, about 20% of all fit galaxies with stellar masses between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 9 uh, solar masses. So again, this is just uh, to, to say that UDGs are really a population of galaxies, so it's important to, to understand how they form in our, uh, in our current uh, understanding of galaxy formation and evolution. Now, they are present in different environments, they show a dichotomy in the gas fraction, so it's likely that they also have different origins. For example, if you look at some uh, galaxy clusters, you can explain a subset uh, of those UDGs uh, as basically them being dwarf galaxies that due to interactions with the environment became larger. Because basically what you want to explain here is why the galaxies have the extended height uh, distribution. So you can say, okay, some dwarfs interacted with other galaxies, they became larger. Okay, but then the question will be, what happens with those galaxies that are isolated, with those UDGs in isolation, where you don't have the environment to, to make them grow, basically? And for models and simulations, there seem to be two main uh, scenarios. One of them is related with the spin or the dark matter halo, the other one is related with uh, internal processes related to, to, to stellar feedback. So if we look first at this model of the stellar feedback, basically what happens is that, at least from simulations, as, as I was saying, from the Nihau simulations in particular, I and Chinto and collaborators were uh, the, the first people proposing a scenario like, like this for UDGs. So what happens is that they were galaxies that had a very bursty star formation history, that because of the very efficient feedback implementations uh, they use, 
uh, they generate a, a very powerful uh, gas outflows. So when you have these powerful outflows, they change the potential of the galaxy, but it also changes not only the baryonic, but also the dark matter distribution, distribution, such that in the end, the baryons have moved to more external orbits because you reduce the potential in the center of the galaxy. Okay, and then because you, you permanently modify the potential, the baryons do not collapse again. So this uh, leads to a galaxy that has a larger a disk scale length or effective radius than expected. So again, this is thanks to, uh, to these powerful feedback-driven outflows. The other idea is that this has nothing to do with feedback processes, but instead has to do with the spin of the dark matter halo. So basically, as you know, in semi-analytical models, uh, the size of a galaxy, the effective radius, is proportional to the spin of the dark matter halo. So basically, by construction, you can obtain that if you have a, a population of, of dwarf galaxies that have a high spin a dark matter halo, then they will end up with a larger effective radius. So this is the, the alternative. It may also be a combination of both, right? Because from observations, it's not very clear if one of these models uh, is correct, or if any of these models is correct. So we would want to constrain this. So far, the most complete study uh, of, uh, of UDGs, in, in, of H1 in UDGs, was performed by Luke Leisman and collaborators. So basically what they did was uh, matching the alfalfa catalog with, uh, with the DSS catalog. And they said, okay, of these galaxies that I detect in alfalfa, which of them can be classified as ultra diffuse galaxies according to some standard definition using the SDSS photometry? And they found around 115 of these objects. Now by selection based by, by, by definition, yes, they are H1 rich because they were detected in alfalfa to start with. And by selection, uh, they kept only those objects that are also uh, isolated. And this is important because it means that whatever you find about these galaxies shouldn't be, in principle, uh, attributed to the environment. Uh, now, perhaps uh, the most uh, important result uh, among a, a very nice set of results they show is that if you look at the, at the global H1 profile of UDGs, and then you extract the velocity width, which is a proxy for the rotation, these galaxies have narrower velocity widths compared with other galaxies with similar mass, but that are not UDGs. This is not the original plot, this is just a sketch I made to, to illustrate this, where you see that the, the, the peak of the distribution for UDGs uh, is a uh, 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 velocity widths which are narrower than for other galaxies with similar mass. So uh, this suggests that the galaxies may have, may show interesting kinematic features, but it's a bit hard to, to tell more by just using a uh, global H1 profiles. So ideally you want to have resolved data. You want to have rotation velocities if you want to study gas kinematics in detail. And this is what we have been doing, uh, what I have been doing for, for my PhD so far. So we, we have published a, a couple of papers, one of them last year in September or so, and the second of them was published last month or so uh, in monthly notices. And this is uh, what I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, today. So I'm going to show you a set of rather startling properties that we are finding regarding these gas-rich ultra-diffuse galaxies. Uh, well, now very briefly, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, all, all our collaborators in this couple of papers, which of course have played a, a fundamental role. Uh, I just want to publicly acknowledge uh, all their work. And well, let me tell you what we have been doing. So we obtain uh, interferometric H1 observations using the VLA and the Betterboard Synthesis Radio Telescope for six galaxies that were coming from this catalog of Lisman that I was telling you about. So for six galaxies, now we have resolved data. Now these galaxies have about 10 to the 9 solar masses in H1, and by selection, they are very extended. So the effective radius, uh, the effective radii are larger than, than two kiloparsecs. They are also very distant. The mean distance of the sample is 90 megaparsecs, which is very good because at such large distances or velocities, the, possibly, uh, the possible effect of peculiar velocities are really negligible because, I mean, compared with the sustained velocity of the galaxies. And this means that Hubble flow distances give you a rather accurate uh, measurement of the distance to these galaxies. And this is how our data look like. So you can see on the left, 
uh, the stellar emission of the galaxy with the H1 contours on top. So we see again that the H1 is more extended than the light distribution, even for these galaxies that are extended in the stellar distribution. And on the right, you have uh, the velocity field that shows this uh, clear kinematic pattern typical of rotating disks. This was perhaps the, the, our first result because we'll find that all the galaxies have, uh, have this kind of, of kinematic pattern. And then if you extract uh, the, the velocities along the kinematic major axis of the galaxy, you can build the so-called PV diagram that shows, uh, well, the velocity of the galaxy as a function of the offset from the center along the kinematic major axis, where you see again this a uh, clear pattern uh, of rotation. So far, so good. The problem is that this gray ellipse that you see here is the beam of our observations. So even when we have resolved data, this is low resolution data. You typically have two uh, resolution elements per, per galaxy size. And this is very problematic because low resolution data suffer from something called a uh, beam smearing. So very quickly, let me tell you what is this beam smearing about. Well, let's say that you observe a galaxy with this super good, very high uh, resolution. And then you build the velocity field that will look like this, very nice. Then if you do this thing of fitting uh, rings to this velocity field, you recover this uh, nice rotation curve, you see, goes up, stays flat, and this uh, ve uh, velocity dispersion profile. Okay, that's great. The thing is, what happens if you have low resolution data like this? So this is, we're talking about exactly the same galaxy, but because instead of having the high resolution, you are using low resolution, now your velocity field looks like this. I mean, it's exactly the same galaxy, it's just the, the, the price that you pay for using a lower resolution. And the problem is that if then we fit uh, this velocity field, we end up with these blue points. So you can see that this is a disaster because you dramatically underestimate the circular speed and you dramatically overestimate the, the, the velocity dispersion profile. So instead of having this rotation dominated galaxy with a flat rotation curve, you end up with a dispersion dominated galaxy with a solid body like rotation curve. So the kinematics that you derive will be completely wrong. So the question is, if we have low resolution data, what can we do in order to obtain a meaningful kinematics? Well, what we have been doing is using the software uh, 3D Barolo. So I don't have a lot of time to go into the details of, of 3D Barolo or Barolo by short, which uh, was developed by Enrico Di Tedoro and Filippo Fraternali. But basically, instead of fitting the velocity field, which in the end, the velocity field is just a collapsed version of your data cube, Barolo uh, fits the whole data cube. So it uses the information in on the channel maps. And very importantly, it takes into account the shape of the beam given a, a, a given observation. And then when it makes models, it takes into account this beam to compare it with the data. So this basically gets rid of the beam smearing. Uh, in case you were wondering, Barolo, uh, the name, okay, it has a name, but the real name is, is because of this famous Italian wine that both Enrico and Filippo uh, fancy a lot. Uh, but Barolo is not only this nice Italian wine because it also performs very well with low resolution data, as I show you here now. So if we use Barolo in the low resolution observations, now we obtain the red points. So again, red points are blue points, are obtained using exactly the same data, but the red points are using this 3D approach, 3D because you have the whole data cube instead of the velocity field, uh, this 3D approach of Barolo. So you see that you can recover the shape and the value of the rotation and of the velocity dispersion, which is exactly what we want. So Barolo uh, is largely unaffected by beam smearing, which allows us to obtain robust kinematics. Now this has been tested, uh, Barolo has been tested before in, in many galaxies. Here I've shown you a few more examples where you have again rotation curves, velocity dispersion profiles. In blue, you see the high resolution observations. So you can think about this as the intrinsic uh, kinematics. And then in green are the results uh, that you obtain if you use a low resolution data using traditional methods. And in red, what you obtain uh, if you use Barolo on the same data as the green points. So we see that what happens with beaming is always the same. You underestimate the velocity, you overestimate the dispersion, you see solid body like rotation curves, but Barolo manages to, to take care of all this and recovers the correct kinematic parameters. 
Now, just to make sure we wanted to further uh, test uh, this, so what we did was uh, extracting a, a set of drag galaxies from the Apostle Hadrodynamical Simulations for which we have produced artificial data cubes. So these artificial data cubes have the same signal to noise and the same low resolution as our observations. And then uh, we try to, to recover the kinematics with Barolo. And I show you here the results. So you have two rotation hoods for two dwarf galaxies from Apostle, where you have in gray the intrinsic rotation curve coming from, from the simulations, and in red uh, the results that Barolo find for these artificial data cubes that have, again, the same signal to noise and resolution as our observations. So once again, uh, we have checked that, uh, that Barolo manages to recover meaningful kinematic parameters for our data, for data like ours. So now, finally, let me show you some of, of our results. So this is, a, this is for, for one of our galaxies. You see here on the top, the observed velocity field, and on the bottom, the model velocity field. So you can immediately see that the resemblance uh, is very good. The models are quite realistic, which you can also see here on the right, again, with the position velocity diagram, where in black you have the data, in red you have the best fitting model, and in this case, the yellow points are the rotation velocities. Now, something that is also uh, interesting to notice here, uh, and, and you will see this immediately, especially if you are sort of familiar with 3D diagrams, is that this position velocity diagram is rather narrow. Usually, uh, dwarf galaxies, galaxies in general, have a thicker uh, 3D diagrams. And this suggests that the galaxies have a low gas velocity dispersion. I'm going to say uh, a couple of things uh, about that a bit later. And this is just another example for another galaxy. Again, the observed velocity field, the model velocity field. So again, the resemblance is quite nice. And then the PV diagram, which you have in black the model, in red the data. I think I said the other way around. In black the data. In black the data, yes. <laughs> in red the best fitting model. And in yellow the rotation velocities. So again, we see that, that the resemblance is, is, is very good. Now, something else that we noticed was that the velocity uh, rotations that were, the, the rotation velocities that we were finding, the circular speeds, were uh, rather low. And this was curious because the baryonic mass of the galaxies is not so small. So we're wondering, okay, what's happening with the dark matter content of these galaxies? So to study this, uh, to study dark matter content, and here I want to make uh, something very clear. So here we are talking about the dark matter. I'm going to be talking about the dark matter fraction inside the extent of the H1 disk. So this doesn't mean the whole dark matter halo. It just means the dark matter fraction inside the extent of the H1 disk. So to study this, we look at this diagram that shows the baryonic mass, the ratio between the baryonic mass and the dynamical mass. So basically, this tells you how much dark matter there is inside the extent of the H1 disk as a function of the dynamical mass, where the dynamical masses are uh, directly estimated from the rotation curves. Now, uh, basically, if you are in this part of the, of the diagram, you are baryon dominated. If you are in this part of the diagram, you are dark matter dominated. And typical dwarf galaxies, here I show you some examples from the little thin galaxies from, uh, from Giuliano Giorgio et al. Uh, they, as we were discussing in the introduction, have very high dark matter fractions. So typical dark matter fractions of 90%, even higher. You have a couple of cases with, with, with lower dark matter fractions, but in general, and this is true for the vast majority of dark galaxies, of low super dense galaxies, uh, the dark matter dominates at any given radius. So given that our ultra diffuse galaxies are very low surface brightness galaxies, they should be also here. They should be heavily dark matter dominated. So when we plot our galaxies, that was what we were expecting. But instead, we find them here. So we're finding that these H1 rich EVGs have very low dark matter fractions between 0 and 0 0.5. So this means that they have very little room for, for dark matter inside the extent of the H1 disk, which is a very surprising because, as I have said many times, low surface brightness galaxies should be dominated at any given radius by the dark matter component, while here this is not the case. So this was uh, the first uh, surprising result that we found for, for these galaxies. And the next thing was, we said, okay, this low dark matter uh, fraction suggests that the galaxies may have like an atypical mass distribution. So is, do they follow normal scaling laws? Do they follow other scaling relations? 
And arguably, uh, the most important scaling relation uh, for galaxies is the so-called baryonic Cooley-Fisher relation that links the luminous matter via the baryonic mass with the dark matter via the circular speed of the galaxies, because basically this is given by the potential, which is often dominated by dark matter. Now, uh, let me briefly sketch the baryonic Cooley fisher relation. So from observations, we know that, that the, the baryonic mass scales at the circular speed to the power of four. So we have this clear uh, uh, relationship with this dependency. How do you explain this? Well, one way to explain this in a lambda CDM context is by first looking at the relation that you expect for dark matter halos, which will be this dashed line. So this is the relation between uh, the circular speed at the virial radius of a dark matter halo and the, 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 the mass. So you see that you expect uh, the relation to have a, a, a dependency that I mean, the mass goes as the velocity to the, to the third power. So both the slope and the normalization are different which of course makes sense because we know that there is a baryon fraction in the universe. There is a cosmological baryon fraction, which means that if you have this black dashed line for dark matter halos, you should take into account that compared with the dark matter, baryons are just around 15%. So if you take into account this cosmological baryon fraction, you lower your relation. So you see that now you end up with this gray line, which is a relation where a galaxy that has all of their baryons should be. So we see that the normalization is now closer to the observations, but it's not quite uh, there yet. And the slope is also different. So then how do you explain uh, these differences? Well, uh, briefly, uh, brief basically people uh, attribute these differences to, to mass losses, either to, to age, uh, and this is, this is feedback, right? So basically you could have here black hole AGN feedback at the high mass regime, stellar feedback uh, from supernovas at the low mass regime, such that when you take into account uh, all these processes, you go from these theoretical expectations for galaxies with all of their variants to, uh, uh, to the empirical uh, baryonic Cooley-Fisher relation. Now, sometimes people refer to, to this discrepancy in, in mass as the missing variants because those are variants that should be there, but due to different processes, galaxies uh, got rid of them. Now, how, do this look, uh, how does this look with, with real observations? Well, it looks like this. So we have, again, the baryonic mass as a function of the circular speed, in this case for three different samples, where you see how nicely uh, the, the data are uh, along this, uh, this main sequence here. Now, given the baryonic masses that we measure for our UDGs, they should be somewhere here in this orange region. And they are going to be there because galaxies follow the baryonic to the Fisher relation except that they are not there. So we find that these CDGs are outliers of the burning to fisher relation. They shift off. Specifically, they have circular speeds, a factor two to four lower than galaxies at similar baryonic masses, or they have a baryonic masses a factor 10 to 100 larger than galaxies rotating at similar circular speeds. So they, 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 this is a, a, a huge shift. It's not something uh, that you can uh, that you can really reconcile uh, easily. But we said, wait, I mean, there might be something wrong because galaxies must follow the baryonic cooley fisher relation. So perhaps we're either overestimating the baryonic mass and the galaxies should move in this vertical direction, or we are underestimating the circular speeds and then the galaxies should move in this horizontal direction and they go back to the cooley fisher in the papers, we, we discuss a why uh, this is unlikely to be the case. But very briefly, what happens is the following. In the case of the baryonic masses, these galaxies are dominated by the gas. So if you say stellar mass equals zero, the galaxies don't care. The galaxies don't move from this position, basically. Then the H1 mass is dominated by the flux of the galaxies, which is very easy to measure from, from the H1 observations, and by the distance. But I discussed before that the distances are rather robust. So there is no way in which you are overestimating the baryonic mass by a factor of 10 or 100. So we say, okay, it's not the baryonic mass. What about the circular speed? Is that being underestimated? Well, it's also not the case. I showed you before that the galaxies show these clear kinematic patterns of rotation, and we're tracing the rotation curve, the rotation velocities, at a radius, typically uh, 10 kiloparsecs, where the rotation curve of galaxies doesn't go up anymore. They are already tracing the flat part of the rotation curve. 
And then we also discuss uh, in detail why the inclinations are, are quite safe. So basically, if you want to put these galaxies back in the tuli fisher relation uh, by changing the inclination, you will see that all of them will need to be face on, which is uh, statistically uh, is not possible. And also just if you compare the data, uh, how, how should they look if they were face on, you see that it's totally incompatible with how do the data uh, look like. So it's also not a matter of, of inclination. So based on all this, we concluded that in fact, this H1 ritual is shift off from the varying tuli fisher relation, which is again very interesting and very surprising. Now it's very interesting, but it's not the only interesting thing that we can learn from, from this diagram. Because let's look at, at, the, at the, uh, these two lines that we were looking at before. So the black dashed line, again, is the relation between uh, the circular speed uh, at the viral radius for a dark matter halo and the virial mass. And then if you multiply that by the cosmological variant fraction, you end up with this ray line, which is a line where galaxies that have all of their variants should be. And we see that within the uncertainties, all our UVG are compatible uh, with this ray line, which means that they have a variant fraction which is close, which is similar to the cosmological bar, uh, value, to the cosmological mean. In other words, these galaxies are compatible with having no missing variants within the real radius. But wait, because these galaxies are dwarfs, so they have shallow potential wells, and they are mostly made of gas, so how is it possible that they've managed to retain all of their variants? So our idea is that these galaxies have experienced a weak feedback, sort of a failed feedback, and they, didn't, uh, they weren't able to get rid of the gas. Basically, they didn't manage to drive outflows, and so the, the, the variants stayed within the galaxy. This is perhaps related with the low gas velocity dispersion that we observe in the disks that tell you that at least currently, there is very little turbulence in the H1 disk. So that's what we think uh, is going on. Now, this idea of, of Fa uh, fail feedback or with feedback uh, seems to go or seems in tension with, with many uh, uh, simulations. Uh, however, there are also observational results that, that, I, that have results among the same line where you see that uh, the mass losses in verb galaxies are not as big as predicted by many, by many simulations. Now, basically this was what we found in the first paper, uh, but we wanted to understand a bit more what was happening with, with this tulip fisher relation. Specifically, we wanted to know what is driving this deviation, this subset. So to study this, uh, among other things, in the second paper, we, we revisited the, the, the varying tulip fisher relation, but this time we added uh, some more galaxies from the literature, specifically some other galaxies classified as UDGs. And you see that this uh, region here that before was empty starts to uh, to be uh, a bit more populated. So since we found that there were more galaxies in this region, we, we investigated if these galaxies had uh, some physical property in common, or in other words, if there is a third parameter at these velocities in the varying to fisher relation. Now to study this, we build this diagram here that shows on the vertical axis is the is the, the mass offset, so it's a vertical offset from the varying tuli fisher relation. So if you are up here, it means that you are uh, in a higher position with respect to the varying tuli fisher relation as a function of the optical disk scale length. So if you are here on the right, it means that you have a very extended light distribution. And uh, we are interested basically in galaxies with circular speeds below 50 kilometers per second. So we are looking at this region of the varying tuli fisher relation. So if you put these galaxies inside this box in this plot, you obtain something like this. So we see that there is this trend between the vertical mass offset and disk scale length, such that larger dwarf galaxies deviate more upward from the varying tuli fisher relation. Now, by selection, by definition, our UDGs are those dwarfs with the largest disk scale lengths. So that's why they, are, they end up here. But even if you exclude uh, the UDGs, our UDGs, uh, this trend uh, is, is, is still there. And, and well, this, this, uh, this was very important for us because this gave us a extra motive, a, an extra reason of why we have this trend in the, in the burning tool fisher relation. Now, because, I mean, because this means that there is this, the, the disk scale length is a third parameter at the low velocity regime of the burning tool fisher relation. 
But you are probably aware that different authors have found no correlation between the receivables of the barium include fissure relation and other galaxy properties. Just to give two recent examples, uh, Lely et al. and Ponomareva et al. Uh, have shown that there are no uh, systematic receivables as a function of the effective radius, the Hubble type, the central surface brightness, the gas fraction. So if these people found that there are no correlations uh, of the residuals of the Tully Fisher with our galaxy properties, why are we now finding this? Well, we think that this is uh, at least partially plated with the, with the samples. So if you look at this couple of works, they mostly have galaxies rotating at velocities above 80, 60 kilometers per second. So they didn't really have a strong presence of, of smaller dwarfs. So that's why we think once you include these galaxies in this region, then you end up with this, with this trend uh, that we found between the deviation of the Tully fissure and the disk scale length. Now, very briefly, we are in the process of obtaining more uh, BLA data for, for, for the UDGs. So this is yet uh, to be published. But I show you here in, in sort of red brown, the new two of the two UDGs that have new observations uh, from, from the BLA. And we see that one of them is actually on the Tully fissure. This is very interesting because we see that some UDGs are actually on the Tully fissure relation, while the other is very close to, to the position of, of, of our galaxies, and also matches very well uh, with this trend of the offset of the Tully fissure as a function of the disk scale length. Also recently, uh, there was this paper by Karuna Khan and collaborators uh, that use unresolved kinematics. So these results, you should see them as, I mean, with a grain of salt because, because they are using uh, global profiles instead of resolved data. They are using uh, optical inclination, which may not be fully representative of the, of the inclination of the H1 disk, but taken at, at a face value, their galaxies that I show here as the green uh, crosses match very well with our distribution of galaxies both in the Tully feature relation and also in this plot that shows the, the, vertic uh, the vertical offset on the Tully fissure and the disk scale length of galaxies. So this is of course uh, reassuring because uh, well, different people are trying to find a different uh, the same results with, with similar uh, data for a similar uh, for the same galaxy population. Now, is this trend that we observe consistent somehow with this idea of, of a weak feedback? We think that at least uh, qualitatively it is. Why? Well, because all these galaxies have normal or low star formation rate uh, surface uh, star formation rates. But then those that are larger, like DDGs, have easily a star formation rate surface density, which can be a factor 10 or 20 lower than smaller galaxies. And if you lower your star formation rate surface density, you also lower your efficiency, your capability of driving powerful outflows that then get rid of the gas. So that's why they, 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 they didn't lose uh, the, the variance we think. This seems in, in line with recent results using high resolution hydrodynamical simulations of isolated dark galaxies. In particular, Romano et al. have shown uh, for a ultra faint dwarf galaxy that in fact, if you have a, a very low star formation rate surface density, so your, your OV, your star forming regions are very spread, then the galaxy, uh, basically you don't form super bubbles, so you don't manage to, to drive powerful outflows uh, uh, out of the galaxy, and then you will need external factors to get rid of all, of, uh, of all, of, of all the gas. So this seems uh, uh, in agreement with this, uh, scenario with this sketch that we are uh, that we are proposing. Uh, now let me say uh, something else I'm about to finish because all these things will explain the position of the galaxies uh, on the Tully Fisher relation but they don't explain why the galaxies have the large disk scale length to start with. Uh, which was the main question during the introduction right? And as you remember uh, there were two uh, main scenarios. One of them was related to these uh, feedback processes that seems at least partially in tension with, with these results, although it's not completely clear. And the other, uh, uh, the other option was related with the, with the spin of the armature halo. So basically with the angular momentum. Now the problem is that constraining the spin parameter from observations uh, is, is very hard 
and I would say for UDGs, it's just not feasible. Uh, so we are looking at a more uh, observational approach of this, which is looking at the relation between the stellar specific angular momentum, so this is the angular momentum in the, in the stars weighted by the stellar mass, as a function of the stellar mass. Sometimes this is called the, the fall relation because Mike Fall has uh, some very nice papers regarding this. Now this relation has been recently determined with very, uh, very good accuracy by, by Lorenzo Posti and, and collaborators, and you have here the main relation. So the question will be, where are our UDGs in this diagram? Now for, to, to, to make this plot, to, to, to measure the stellar specific angular momentum, you actually need high resolution rotation curves and, and well, and the stellar surface density profile. Uh, but we don't have the high resolution observations for our EDGs. So we, just, we can just estimate a rough value of, the, of, the, of this J star, the stellar specific angular momentum, uh, for our EDGs. So these results that I'm going to show you, you can uh, take them with a grain of cell. They are sh 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 uh, sort of preliminary because they need to be corroborated with better data. But if you put uh, the UDGs in the diagram, you have something like this. So you see that on average, and the average is shown here with this uh, red square, on average, UDGs may have a stellar specific angular momentum, which is a factor three or so, which is larger than what you would expect for other dwarf irregular galaxies at similar stellar masses. So again, this should be corroborated with their data, but seems to go along uh, this direction of, of a, high, a high angular momentum uh, to explain the, the large disk scale legs. And well, the, uh, this actually takes me to my conclusions. So I have uh, shown you that average country GDGs do not follow the varying fuel efficient relation. They have circular speeds which are too low given the varying masses. They have very low dark matter fractions within the extent of the H1 disk. They are compatible with having non bis invariance with individual radius. So here we wonder, is this a population of galaxies where feedback failed? There is a third parameter in the variant to fisher relation at the low velocity regime, which is the disk scale length. And I have briefly sketched how can this be related with the star formation rate surface density. And as I was just showing you, there are at least some hints that this H1 rich DGs may have a high width and average the stellar specific angular momentum that could then explain the large uh, disk scale lengths. Now these results and a few others are shown here in this couple of papers, so please uh, well, have a look if you are interested. You can also get the papers if you scan the, the QR codes. Um, and well, that's it. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take uh, the questions you may have. Thank you, Pavel, for this very nice talk. And um, uh, <clears throat> to everybody, if uh, anyone wants to make a question, just raise your hand. I raise my hand. Okay. Can you me? Enrique? Si. Sí. Then Isabel and Monica. Okay. Go on, Enrique. Pavel, fantastica charla. Me ha encantado. Enhorabuena. Muchísimas <laughs> gracias. Okay, so here we have these two effects of uh, 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 low uh, specific uh, star formation rates. Uh, these uh, star formation rates are from what, H-alpha emission? So these star formation rates, yes, they are estimated. Uh, so there was a first attempt to measure them using uh, SED fitting which is not very accurate because the galaxies are, I mean, they are very faint. So even if you have different filters in most of them, you see nothing. So then, uh, yeah, people measure them basically using the, it was with Galax, actually. Uh, so it comes from, from those fluxes. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, I mean, they are uh, accurate up to a, a given point, but for sure that's something else that has a, a big room for improvement, sustaining. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what do we know about the stellar population in this object? Um, beyond what you just mentioned, that there is a broad band uh, SED. So, so this changes a bit with the environment, of course, but broadly speaking, so if you look at those UDGs in clusters, they have red colors. I mean, 
I know G minus R of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, so red sequence uh, uh, colors. Instead, when you look at this H1 rich uh, UDGs, uh, they have a way, way bluer colors. So I don't know, typical G minus R of 0, 0 0.2. So the, the stellar populations should uh, for sure uh, be, be younger. Okay, so um, I have a couple of uh, uh, suggestions uh, that may also uh, imply uh, this uh, low supernova feedback efficiency, which seems to be uh, your bet for the physical explanation for this, okay? One would be a very low star formation history uh, in general. And, and the other probably uh, goes more to the point is uh, a truncated IMF. If you don't have uh, very high mass stars in the IMF, then you wouldn't have the, the feedback. Yes, yes, yeah, I completely agree. I think those are two, two crucial tests uh, to, to do. I mean, the point of obtaining the star formation uh, histories is, is quite challenging, even even for some UDGs which are uh, close. So there are people. Yes, my, my uh, close. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's quite hard. There are some attempts uh, from people like, like Tomas Ruiz Lara or Anna Ferremato, where but but it's challenging. But for sure, with something very useful. Also, because for instance, the the Nihau simulations predict right these birds of star formation histories. So that will also. Uh, let you assess a bit better the, the comparison between them. And, and yeah, for sure what you say is very important because if it's somehow you can measure the, 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 I, the IMF and you see this, this lack of, of massive stars, then everything starts to, to match well. Okay, gracias. Okay, we have several other questions. Isabel. Hello, um, thank you very much for your talk, Pavel, it's been nice. And, uh, um, even more thank you is for, for having done such a, a nice introduction, taking into account the broad, uh, the broad audience we have at the IAA. So thank you very much for this. And um, um, my question, um, first I apologize because I have been distracted, I mean interrupted during five, five minutes in, during your talk. So I don't know if I missed the point because I wasn't uh, uh, paying attention to that. Um, it's respect to, with respect to the environment of those UDGs. Um, so what, what's the kind of environment uh, they are living in? Yes, thanks for the question. It's a very good question. So, uh, so in general, one can find uh, UDGs in, in, in very different environments. So people have found UDGs in very high uh, uh, mass galaxy clusters, uh, but also in, in, where is this plot? It's right. Here. So if you go to these supermassive clusters, like 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 solar masses, you find UDGs, but you also find them in, in, in lower uh, galaxy groups. Uh, and in particular, uh, our UDGs are, are, in, are in the field, so they are, they are isolated. So basically, the, the selection criteria that, that Leisman and collaborators did, because in the end, that's like the, the, our parent uh, catalog or parent sample, uh, was basically selecting uh, those galaxies that are in alfalfa, that are UDGs according to SDSS, and then they removed uh, any galaxy that has a, a close neighbor. And by close, uh, it means that if the galaxy is included in this catalog, it cannot have any neighbor within uh, 500 kiloparticles in projection. And 500 kiloparticles in projection, and a plus minus, this should be 500 kilometers per second in, in velocity. Mm -hmm. so, so they make sure that they are, they are a sort of, of isolated, which also makes sense because, because they are H1 rich, so usually you will have a, a gas per galaxy otherwise. So that's why we, we also think that, the, that probably the, these properties are sort of a, inner and sort of fundamental from the formation mechanism and not really something related with the, with the environment because at least what we see uh, uh, today, the galaxies don't really have massive neighbors to, to, to affect them too strongly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another question by Monica. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very nice and also very easy to follow. So my question was uh, also related with Isabel's question about the, the environment. So then I understand that all these galaxies are isolated, right? Yes. So do you don't have any comparison with galaxies that are in the clusters? No, no. The problem is that, I mean, we have comparisons in terms of, for example, of colors. In terms of, and, and in colors, we, we know that those in clusters are redder. We have comparisons in terms of, of stellar masses. And for example, Javier has this nice paper where they show that the stellar masses, Javier, please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I recall correctly, the stellar masses of those GDGs in isolation are typically a, lower than those GDGs in, in clusters, a bit lower, not that much. Um, and we, we know we have comparison, for example, in the search in the distribution. Both of them have basically exponential like profiles. But in terms of the kinematics, uh, there are very few. The problem is that then for those GDGs that are not in isolation, you don't have the H1. So the, the kinematics are hard to trace. Then you need to start using things like global cluster kinematics, uh, things like that, that then become a bit harder. So for sure, for complete, uh, for analogs to our galaxies, we don't have like counterparts uh, in, in clusters where we have something like H1 kinematics. Uh, but for some other GDGs, uh, they, there are kinematic measurements. There are these couple of papers by Michael Beasley, for example, and collaborators, or a couple of papers from, from Fandocum. Where, et al, where they show kinematics uh, and the, the results are a bit uh, all over the place because some people have found, for instance, that, that some EDGs are, are dark matter, heavily dark matter dominated, like 90%, 95%, things like that. Some of them are considered with living in, in very big dark matter halos, some of them in dwarfs. Um, accord, uh, so yes, I mean, there is not a clear consensus on on what should the the, the kinematics of these galaxies uh, what should the kinematics uh, be. So it's a bit hard to compare because because the, I mean just because of the difference in the environment you don't know if if the galaxies were actually going through the same uh, evolutionary path. So so yeah, I know if that okay. answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Actually, yeah, my question, another question that I have, it was related with the plot that you show, the fraction of dark matter. Can you put the plot again? Because, uh, because you compare your galaxies with uh, typical dwarfs, right? Yes. And have you compared with normal galaxies? Because, yeah, it's also very surprised that you get very little fraction of dark matter, no? At the beginning, when these galaxies were discovered, but actually, uh, the outstanding thing was that, uh, that these galaxies had a lot of uh, uh, dark matter, no? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. There are these, these couple of uh, these galaxies like Dragonfly 44, uh, this galaxy in this paper from Michael Beasley, where they show super high uh, dark matter fractions. So, so, yeah, I mean, here I just compared with bars because are those that have a similar uh, range in dynamical mass. So if you want to plot uh, more massive galaxies, uh, then you, well, you need to expand this plot and then they will be somewhere here, 10 to the 11, 10 to the, yeah, 10 to the 11 or so. So I don't have them here, uh, but, but in that sense, uh, they are more similar, these CDGs are more similar to those massive galaxies because, so basically here, uh, this is measured within the H1 radius, which is typically uh, for disk scale lengths. So if you look at spiral galaxies within a couple of scale lengths, big spiral galaxies, they also have very low dark matter fractions. So in, in that way, uh, these UDGs will be more similar to, to those galaxies. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks, Dean, that's all. Thank you. Two more questions, Mike and Lourdes. Please, Mike, first. So, um... So uh, I wanted to ask uh, about the baryonic Tully fisher relation. So, um, I mean, there's, from my understanding with, with simulations, when people look at this relation in hydrodynamic simulations, you know, they argue with the observers about how big the scatter should be and whether there should be a turn in the relation at low masses and things. So I was wondering whether these kind of disagreements, whether you think they can just 
be resolved by including low surface brightness galaxies? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good and very hard question because yeah, I mean, so, uh, most, I mean, a very big uh, discussion or something that people usually uh, give a lot of importance to is to the to the scatter of the variant tulip fisher relation, right? So there are all these papers by Anastasia Ponomareva, especially from from Federico Lely, where they say, look, the scatter is almost consistent with with zero, and that is a problem for lambda CDM because you should have a scatter that is related with the scatter in the distribution of the spin parameter for dark matter halos and with the uh, with the mass size relation of this galaxy so the scatter should be larger so this is a fail for lambda cdm and so on so i mean the 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 so what i like the picture that we start to have now is that although it's a picture that it was there before because if you look at these papers i don't know oman et al 2015 uh, Jeha et al. 2006, you always see that when you look at the at the low velocity regime, the scatter increases. And so both people from simulation and people from, from observations like 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 Lely and so on, they always say, ah, this larger scatter is just because you have things that are harder to measure, but the galaxies are actually perfectly consistent with the least feature. But I think now we're uh, getting to a point, we're reaching a point where, where you can really not explain these differences by invoking errors in, in baryonic masses or inclinations or circular speeds and so on. So it looks like, like the, at least at the low velocity regime, or that's what, what these results uh, suggest, there is a, a change in the phenomenology of the tulip fisher relation. So I, I don't know, I wouldn't say it breaks, but then this nice thin distribution becomes a basically a broader 2D distribution, which of course will, will increase the, the scatter uh, a lot. Uh, this also represents so so in in, in the lambda cdm context i think i mean the, the in principle the low baryon fractions are i wouldn't say easy because simulations they struggle to produce even normal dwarf galaxies nowadays so they would struggle even more to produce this kind of, of udgs but at least there is this idea of this fail feedback that sort of could reconcile uh, uh, everything uh, in alternative theories like mond or so on then it's much harder to explain uh, a population of galaxies like, like this. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that, yeah, as you were well saying, some simulations predict that there should be a bend in the Tully feature, but that bend is actually in the other direction. So they will predict that the galaxies end up somewhere here, like rotating too fast for a given baryonic mass. So this will be yeah, like exactly on the, on the opposite direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, and if I may, I just have another very quick question. Um, so what are the prospects of higher resolution data, either for nearer galaxies or with longer baselines? Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. so the, the problem is that, I mean, for example, we, we now apply to, uh, for telescope time with the VLA to obtain a high resolution, high res I mean, high, the problem is that these things are so far, you want them to be far away because then, well, the H1 masses are big, but also because then you have accurate measurement of the distances. Uh, the problem is that then the farther away they are, the less resolved they are. So for these galaxies, with the, this is a CR ray uh, observations from the VLA, you have these two resolution elements, as you know. So we, we, we got time to observe uh, this galaxy, actually the most extreme one, using a BLA uh, configuration in the, in the BLA array configuration in the BLA. So with that, it's still very challenging because you need 50 hours to get more or less the same signal to noise that you get with the with the CRA observation, which is signal to noise of five, ten, no, not ten, five, eight, maybe. Uh, and in the end, even with those high resolution observations, we plan to get three or four resolution elements per galaxy side. So it's still basically four points in the rotation curve instead of two. So, so it's a bit hard. It should be easier to do for, for uh, galaxies that are a bit more closer to us. Uh, but, but I don't think people have uh, done it so far. I hope someone is planning to do it. Thank you. Okay, we have another question by Lourdes. Hi, Pavel. Hello. Uh, it's great to see how many things you have 
learned and done since we met <laughs> two years ago <laughs> or oh, one year and a half years it's really unbelievable and i also joined uh isabel comments on on the how smoothly you presented everything so it's uh, very, very nice to follow i i wanted to go to the method because uh, what uh, what takes your galaxies out from the baryonic tulip fissure relation is that they have uh, it depends on how you see them but that they have lower circular velocities than they should have right yes and uh, that's an effect that uh, as you well you will speak before about that uh, beam smearing uh, can can produce so what you explain is that uh, you are because you are using the 3d barolo so you use the channel maps instead of the moment map in order to model the cube then uh, you improve the problem of uh, beam smearing, right? Yes. Uh, I don't know if it was for the sake of saving time or, or because you didn't, but uh, the way you demonstrated that this fit was good was a comparison with the models. And I think comparison with the derived rotation curve from the optical. Is that right? Uh, no, no, this. So I show a few comparison plots like this or yes. this. So, in, well, in, but in both this cases, this is for simulations. But this is from simulations, and this the is with the real data. Real data, so, but uh, the, the the red points and the blue line. What are they? So the the blue line are so those are for all the galaxies uh, are H one observations, and the blue uh, line is is with the BLA. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. This galaxy must be from Fraternali et al. 2003. 3199 is one. But these Megaman are well-resolved galaxies. galaxies. So they are yes, yes, they are very nearby galaxies with super okay. high uh, resolution. So the point is is how well can you can you recover the original cube uh, when you have low resolution? So yeah, my exactly. question is: I uh, have you compared the channel maps of the three D Barolo model with the original channel maps? and yes. look at the residuals? Yes, yes. I don't think I have the video here. No, probably I removed it. But but yes, I mean, something we did was not only, no, I don't have it here for sure. Let me have to check just in case, but no. So something that, that we did was, I don't know, it was this video, but now it's frozen because it is a PDF. But so basically what, what we did was not only looking at the comparison between the, between the model and the data, like for example, in this plot that I was showing you before of the velocity fields or the PV diagrams, but we also were like very careful in looking at the, at the difference between the, between the channel maps. And especially we we're trying to see, uh, we corroborated that for example, the models of Barolo appear that the channel map where Barolo shows a model is also the first channel map where the data cube shows the emission so that they, 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 there was no emission missing at the, ex, at the end, at both ends of the data cube because of course that will lower your velocity. And, and yeah, I mean, for each galaxy, we very carefully check all the, all the channel maps uh, and there are no systematic residuals. Of course, there are, there are things that, that you cannot completely uh, model uh, I don't know, you see, for example, in this PV diagram, there are some features that they are not going to be perfect, but, but in general, we found that, that the, the main rotation of the galaxy is, is very well recovered. But uh, especially the channel maps, because yes, uh, yes. at the end, the rotation is only one, one direction. Okay, Yes, great. yes, no, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, that was my question, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Pavel? Isabel. Isabel, you raise your hand or? Excuse me, yes, I, um, I yeah. was just speaking to, um, uh, to a mute uh, microphone. Mm -hmm. as, uh, it's very useful uh, <laughs> from my side. So, um, I was wondering whether you have uh, tried to estimate the uh, the discrepancy between the model and, and the observations uh, in the sense of having, I mean, th the whole 3D information using the whole map. Because when, when you compare like this is wonderful, but maybe the uh, just the differences with respect to the model give you some hints on what's going on. 
So have you tried to qu quantify such differences in um, any way? Yes, yes. Well, basically that's, that's like sort of built in inside, inside Barolo because, because so what it does is, so Barolo produces a model of the galaxy channel by channel, and then it computes the, the differences for each channel map between the best fitting model and the data. And basically that's how it minima it well, it chooses which models are, are preferred by minimizing minimizing those residuals. And then um, and then basically the uncertainties that Barolo give are statistical uncertainties given by basically by the shape of the residuals because uh, so it is basically when you start changing parameters like the rotation velocity of the galaxy, then the residuals will increase. When you reach your the, the, the good value, the best fitting value of the velocity, the residuals are low. So basically the uncertainty in Barolo is given uh, in terms of how big is this discrepancy between small changes in velocity and how do they lead to big differences in, in the channel maps. So, so yeah, basically that's how, that's how, how Barolo works, looking at these uh, differences between the individual channel maps. Uh, and other than this, uh, yeah, what we did was uh, similar to, to what Lourdes was asking, was basically making plots of the channel maps and looking at the residuals uh, channel by channel to see that there was nothing uh, systematic. Yeah, but you may even discover different components that you don't see when you consider the whole thing just, I mean, like this. So, so you, you can detect structure in the residuals. Yes, yes, absolutely. Different, of different components, kinematical components. Yes, yeah, we don't find, I think also it's because of the, I mean, the resolution is not great. So probably if there are more subtle things like, I don't know, non-circular motions, extra planar gas, things like that, you don't really, you cannot really resolve them with this sensitivity and resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, I mean, we, we carefully look at the, at the channel maps because I don't know, to understand each small thing, like, for example, in this galaxy, mm -hmm. you see that in the PV diagram or even the velocity field, you have features like, I don't know, like this, that don't look quite associated with the galaxy, but they are there. So then we're looking, okay, where is this emission in the channel maps? Is it associated with the galaxy? Is it systematic? Does it only appear in one channel because it's maybe noise? So things like that, but, but we don't find any, anything. Yeah, but exactly in that, in that example, you can see that the minor axis is, is perfectly perpendicular to the one you, you are tra tracing in gray when you go to the northeast, but to the southwest is completely different. So yes, yes, I mean there's something there. Mm. Yes, yes, I mean not all the galaxies, at least at this at this sensitivity and resolution, are, are perfectly asymmetric. But but let's say for the for the main thing I wanted to do, which was tracing the 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 rotation of the let's say of the main body, uh, this was a uh, yeah this was uh, enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I agree it will be very interesting to, to go mm -hmm. check all these things. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. If there is no more questions, we can close this seminar and thank you again, Pavel, for this very nice talk. Thanks to all of you for thank your you, attention. Pavel.